Uh, kia ora koutou. It's great to have you here today to talk about marine biosecurity, biofouling and hull maintenance. Um, my name is Zoe Hawkins and I'm facilitating today's uh, session on behalf of the councils in the top of the North Marine Biosecurity Partnership. Um, those are the councils from Northland down to Hawke's Bay, along with the Ministry for Primary Industries and the, the Department of Conservation. And they work really closely in the area of marine biosecurity. Um, it's a really strong collaboration. Um, this, this year, along with the Top of the South equivalent um, partnership, we've hosted a number of marine biosecurity seminars uh, on a range of topics um, across aquaculture, uh, marine bio biosecurity and marinas, and also the science behind the work that they're doing. Today's online seminar is about biofouling and hull maintenance. Um, we've specifically designed this one for boat owners. Um, I've owned two boats myself, um, one a race yacht and one a classic launch. And I know and appreciate how involved it is and some of the considerations. Um, and um, it's really great today to be able to arrange this for the uh, team below, behind Clean Below Good To Go and to bring these um, expert speakers to you. Um, so a big welcome to our speakers today. Um, first up, we have Scott Godwin from Auckland Council. He's a marine scientist and he will talk to you about the science of biofouling. Um, we've also introduced Brent um, from Marsden Cove Marina and he's a, an executive member of the New Zealand Marina Operators Association. Um, he's going to talk uh, specifically about some of the practical aspects of um, of, of cleaning and maintaining your boat, choosing an anti-foul and that kind of thing. And then we have four uh, product specialists who are going to speak a little bit about, about some of the innovations that they've come up with. Some of them will be familiar brands to you and some may not. Um, but this is very much an, an international industry um, that's working to manage biofouling um, on all kinds of boats from commercial shipping through to um, the smallest and most humble of, of recreational vessels. So um, the challenges that we might face here in New Zealand, we're certainly certainly not alone and there's, there's some really amazing work going on. Um, so first up, I will welcome Scott. Um, oh, excuse me, first up, I've got a video actually. <laughs> My apologies, one moment. Please tell me if you can't hear the sound when it starts. They can reproduce a lot quicker and they can do that in sometimes multiple ways. They're often a lot more aggressive, so they can take up space, they can take up food, and so they just outcompete those native, space, uh, native species. Sorry. One of the main ways that different species, or particularly marine pests, can travel around is on the bottom of boats. Keep an eye on the bottom and make sure it's clean. Um, anyone out on, on the water taking responsibility for the, for the craft they're in. Um, it's really important that people are checking and maintaining their boats, making sure they are clean below before they are good to go. Go have a look under your hull every now and then. A reduction in diversity, so the number of species present, so it kind of comes as monoculture. That would be disastrous for the poor nights. It's, it's an absolutely cherished spot. Less fish, less kaimoana in certain areas. You don't want to be that boat that spreads marine pests around this pristine coast. It's our backyard, it's our playground. Um, but it's our home. It's our home. And if we don't care about it, who's going to? step up and have responsibility for, for what you're doing. I, I guess being on the ocean is a privilege. All right, thank you. I'm now going to hand the reins over to uh, Scott, who, Scott, you will need to share your uh, presentation with us and you can take it away. Okay. Um, today I'll give an overview of the uh, science that's behind biofouling and um, I'm going to inform you about the whys and hows that you're the reasons you're always having to like uh, deal with maintenance on the surfaces that are uh, below the waterline. Um, are you showing the slides? 
Yeah, I am. Okay, next. <laughs> okay, this map shows uh, tracks commonly used in, by ocean-going vessels in the Pacific. And the isolation and remoteness of New Zealand was essentially negated uh, during the expansion of ocean travel. And um, um, these vessels that have become larger and more advanced uh, that are running these tracks um, are acting as transport mechanisms for marine non-native species through uh, ballast water and biofouling. And biofouling has been determined to be a very important component um, and is recorded as uh, being responsible for 74% of the marine non-natives introduced into Hawaii and up to 69% are for the marine non-natives that have been introduced into New Zealand. All right, next. So there's some examples of uh, what we refer to as marine pests uh, within the biosecurity space. So organisms can get transported and introduced to areas that are non-native to these areas. And some of them have the characteristics uh, to become pest species. Not all do, not all become established. These are examples of some that have become established that we now uh, think of as marine pests. So top left, top right is uh, the fan worm. And uh, this is on both a bolt hole on the top left and associated with aquaculture structures. So a major fouling organism. Uh, the rest of the photos are um, tunicates or sea squirts. Um, the top right is a tunicate that's been introduced and established and is actually becoming quite aggressive in natural habitats in, such as this intertidal zone. Uh, that bottom left is another sea squirt um, that's, as you can see, is associated with a mussel bed and has the potential for overgrowth. Uh, bottom center is a, um, a solitary uh, sea squirt that uh, is a common fowler on boat hulls and uh, marina structures. Next. So this is sort of the, um, the flow of how marine biosecurity works in New Zealand. So starting at the 12 o'clock uh, part of the circle and going clockwise, um, there's pre-border strategies that are overseen by the Ministry for Primary Industries. And they're based on both national and international uh, agreements and guidelines. And there's also border management um, at the uh, about two o'clock position, which is also overseen by Ministry of Primary Industries. And this is done through um, survey and surveillance based on an indices that they use to determine risk uh, with vessels at the border and determine um, um, how to uh, do compliance and enforcement. Uh, surveillance and pathways at the four o'clock and six o'clock positions on the circle are uh, in the realm of the local councils. Uh, surveillance takes the form of a, uh, uh, monitoring established um, organisms that are considered marine pests and looking at uh, spread and ways to control that spread. And with pathways management, that's referring to um, both boating and aquaculture activities and the biofouling that can potentially be transported. Uh, at the uh, nine o'clock position is uh, marine pest management, so species that have become established. And this is generally a partner between uh, Ministry for Primary Industries and the local councils. Next. So I'd like to present uh, briefly the life history of what we call in science, marine sessile invertebrates. This is essentially a, a fancy term for biofouling organisms. So organisms that grow and stay in the same location their whole lives, but they spread through introducing uh, their larvae into the water column. So top is a barnacle community on the right that's established adults. And to the left is their larvae that gets introduced into the water column that swims and settles out in new locations and uh, grows into these adults that you see on the right. Uh, the bottom is a uh, tunicate, sea squirts again, and this is what their larvae looks like in the water column. Uh, microscopic, most of them, and they travel and settle out in certain locations that they feel are ideal uh, by, for their needs and grow into the adults. Next. So sort of the flow of this is you have the adult population, as I stated, and it produces the planktonic larvae and spores. It uh, recruits, as we say, or settles out on a surface, grows into a new adult population, and the whole cycle just starts all over again. And within marina environments, uh, the way it flows is it can go from the uh, structure 
and go to a boat hull. It can go from boat hull to structure, and it also can go between boat hulls. Next. So marine environments provide uh, an ideal habitat for particular non-native species that have very flexible requirements for the surfaces that they develop and grow on. And so some species, not all, will find marine environments to be uh, a really incredible habitat. So there, because there's large amounts of artificial hard surfaces, the break walls, the pontoons, pilings, et cetera. And as I said, some of these kind of habitats are favored by particular uh, non-native marine species, not all of them. And in the tropics, um, as opposed to New Zealand, um, in New Zealand, there is um, seasonality, as we call it. There's certain seasons that larvae get produced or produced into the water more regularly. And whereas in the tropics, where I used to work, uh, the conditions are favorable all year round. And so harbors and marinas uh, with the characteristic image of one at the top right of the slide is um, basically they act as a, uh, an entrainment area for this larvae and the adults and basically can turn the whole uh, place into like a larval suit as we call it. So it's so the design of the marinas that are there to protect the boats also protect and shelter the, the larvae and allow um, a, a very large level of biofouling to ha happen. Next. And so the same um, applies to uh, vessels in general. Um, particular organisms find uh, vessel hull habitats to be ideal for settlement and um, because they provide horizontal and vertical surfaces, shade, sunlight, and all these different needs or requirements that certain uh, biofouling organisms uh, find ideal. So uh, marine growth on your vessel hull is influenced by the characteristic of the boat itself, providing a variety of different types of habitats. Uh, as I stated before, the characteristic of the marina port and port where you're located. And as I stated, the biology of biofouling organisms that find these habitats ideal. Next. So we all know on the left, our slime layer that uh, grows on the boats. And this is the beginning of development of a biofouling community. This slime layer provides um, what we call in science a cue for the larvae that I mentioned earlier to settle out and grow into, and begin growing into adults. And then that community just continues to develop into what you see on the right, a macrofouling type community. And this is essentially uh, in a situation where anti-foul has been uh, applied improperly or not in the right uh, time frames, or um, the vessel is, is very inactive. Next. So this is sort of the flow of how uh, settlement and uh, development of biofouling occurs on boats. Um, as I stated before, this slime layer um, that grows on your vessel hulls is actually what the larvae are looking for. It contains uh, microscopic algae, bacteria, and proteins that they're looking for as a cue for an ideal place to settle out. And organisms that find these vessel hulls and the anti-fouling paint sort of like minimal as far as you know deterring them from doing that will still settle out and they use this slime layer as a cue. They develop into the microfouling communities which are like uh, small barnacles and soft tube worms and those can provide a substrate for further development of a macrofouling community and this is can happen within months if the vessel is inactive or like as I said the anti-fouling co coating is either compromised applied improperly or the timing is not right and the vessel isn't active. Next. So um, when you talk about, um, I'm refer here to antifouling paints is strictly at, at the biocidal level ones and there are other types which the uh, experts on this uh, presentation will be presenting, but essentially biocidal paints are probably the most effective thing to basically keep biofouling uh, spores and larvae from settling out and growing into adults. And historically, uh, these contained uh, tributyl tin and or copper, um, which, were extreme, which are extremely effective. Tributyl tin was banned in 2008 internationally due to environmental concerns, and copper is still used, uh, but is also considered to be an environmental toxin. And so, um, 
this there's a, a big difference in what some people have asked me. It's like, why can't we have tin, tin in our paints anymore? And it's because internationally it was banned in 2008. So basically a whole surface as it shows on the right side is essentially multiple layers of a biocidal, if it's biocidal paint, multiple layers of a biocidal product that's, that can be released um, at sort of, and it's like a molecular thinness. And so basically as the age of the paint um, increases, um, the level of biocidal release decreases. Um, so next. And so um, any anti fouling paints work, but many vessel operators don't renew them at appropriate levels that may have been applied inappropriately. And, um, and the wear on these anti fouling paints can sometimes be variable across the entire hull and in niche areas, which I'm sure we'll be talked about. Um, and there are certain areas that can be devoid of anti-fouling paint if particular types of haul outs are used. So then, for instance, if a vessel is on keel blocks. Um, so next slide. This is an in-water photograph of a vessel that recently out of dry dock uh, had a brand new anti-fouling coat put on, but was sitting on keel blocks. And uh, on the right side, you can see there's a macro fouling community of a variety of different types of organisms uh, that's almost a perfect square with the shape of the keel block that was used. And on the left is the, the appropriate applied biocidal um, paint. Um, and so you can see there's a, a big difference if something's not applied properly or certain steps aren't made to make uniform coating that fouling can still develop. Next. So from this, there's some interesting facts for everyone is that um, anti-fouling coatings work best when a boat is active um, and the breakwaters and other structures that are associated with marinas and ports uh, can elevate the biofouling level in these areas uh, up to 19 times uh, compared to like uh, habitats that are outside of the marinas. And these sessile organisms or biofouling organisms, barnacles being a good example, can be more tolerant of copper anti-fouling paint. And once they get established on a vessel hull, uh, they can act as substrate for other fouling that, and develop into a macro fouling community if the vessel is inactive. And the nature and extent of fouling depends on both the, the boat itself, as I said, the multiple habitats associated with vessels, port environments, and also the biology and the physiology of these type of organisms and particularly organisms that tend to show characteristics towards liking these type of habitats associated with boats and marinas. And that's it for me. Thank you, Scott. <clears throat> so our next speaker is Brent Wilson. Brent is the manager of Marsden Cove Marina and he's also on the executive of the New Zealand Marina Operators Association. And what I really like um, when I hear Brent talking about this topic is he's very knowledgeable and very practical and real. So um, I'd like to welcome, welcome Brent. And Brent, I've got control of your slides. So just let me know when I should move on. Brent. Brent, I'm just having trouble hearing you, so others probably are too. Can you sit close to your computer? Right. Thank you. Okay, how's now? Good, thank you. Okay, the first question I was asked to sort of comment about was what, what makes a good anti foul off the simple answer is one that works. Um, but going through that, it's it's really going to determine on, on, on more factors than just the anti foul, like it's where the boat is, where the boat is, and in New Zealand, they have different anti fouls work in different areas and work better somewhere than somewhere else. Um, but one of the comments I would make is when you do go to purchase anti foul, ask for a little bit more information in regards to data sheets um, on the product because that the stuff that's written on the tin is not always. Um, or the information you require, but the data sheets are actually quite valuable. Um, and it also tells you what's in the product. So I'll go to the next slide. Okay, so obviously most people that are boat owners know the different types. Um, you've got, what's this move move close to your, yep, move Sorry, close, I'm stay close to your computer. <laughs> it's hard to look at my notes and look at the, at the same time. So, um, uh, resins with copper pipe by three options, um, slippery coatings such as um, 
Jesus, just sorry, it just left my mind. Um, Go to that one. The silicons. So um, uh, soft coatings, um, mainly for boats that go slower. Um, hard coatings are more for the launch side of the scenario. Um, so um, where this works, um, the, the yachts or the cruising yachts prefer a softer coating because it comes off easier. Um, the epoxy re resin copper, um, like copper coat, for example, is, is, a, is a pretty good product, but it really requires a, a high lot of maintenance and there's also a high cost to it. Um, okay, next slide. I'm gonna get through this pretty quickly, I think. How to choose the, uh, what types of, types of antifoul? Um, well, on the slide, you're talking about boat wrap, silicon base, um, um, slip liners, ultrasound, um, dry stacking out of the water, of course. Um, when you go to how do we choose an antifoul, um, my advice is generally your, your, your big stores will sell what they think you need. But from my side of the fence, my advice is go and talk to your neighbour, go and talk to your local Chandry store. Don't be afraid of ringing up the product manufacturers and having a good chat to them because it's actually, an ex as we all know, it's an expensive exercise and you really do want it, uh, want it like. A good example is the anti I use on my launch, which is at Marsden Cove. I know it's not that effective, effective up at Opua. And that's to do with the way the tides in the marina down here work versus it being brackish water up in the marina. Um, so your best knowledge is from boats around you, really. <laughs> so don't be afraid, afraid to ask owners of other vessels that are sitting there. Um, also ask your local guys that are in your hard stands putting the product on because they get good feedback. When you pay an, an operator or a service provider to to put on an anti foul, you expect they have the knowledge and they're going to direct you in the right way and because of the cost of it. So, so more information is better. All right, next slide, please. My advice, the whale professional. Um, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a DIY, but I have a slightly professional background. Um, but in all honesty, um, when you look at the DIY boats that come through the hard stands, uh, you see multiple layers of anti-foul and they've not always remembered the anti-foul from the year before. So you've got, you've got cross anti-fouls that sometimes will react with each other. So my advice is go professional. Um, they know what they're doing and they also know how to prepare. Because preparing your vessel is, is probably the, the top end of your anti-foul working once you've got a good product. If it's not prepared right, or, you, or there's anti-foul underneath that doesn't work with the same product that's sitting on top, you, you're certainly going to have issues um, and it's not going to perform as you expect to. So also remember that putting layer and layer and layer of anti-foul on top, on top year after year, doesn't give you a better, um, better solution as far as effectiveness. If anything, it actually slows the product down. And, most people get a shock when they use a professional because they'll turn around and say, look, you've got to be sandblasted or scraped. Um, and that's when the cost comes in. But it's it's really, really important. Um, yeah, so I'm still pushing towards a professional. I DY my own boat because I sort of know what I'm doing. Um, be safe. anti fouls um, are toxic in the yard, so use your right PPE if you're going to do it on your own. Make sure you've got overalls on, keep it off your skin as much as possible. And it's not sleep even where you're breathing mask. And sometimes if you're gonna scrape your boat, definitely um, use some sort of eye protection. Um, and definitely follow the man manufacturer's instructions um, without a doubt. And um, a lot of tins don't come with a lot of information again. So go back to your manufacturer or ask the shop to, to, to supply you because the manufacturers do have um, information about how to apply and what they need to put under if there's any pre-coating. Um, 
One thing now though, I will put it in head is our yards are getting incredibly busy, but also um, in Auckland, for example, there's been yards that have been disappearing. <coughs> so be sure to be getting your boat out or booking your boat out far before um, you think you need to. To give you an example, um, from October on till January of this year, my yard is chock up. So we can't take any more in. So um, yeah, think about that. Um, talk to your boat owners about professionals they've used because you know, like all industries, there's some good and there's some bad. Okay, next slide. What was that? Um, niche areas. It's, it's, this is one of the one of the interesting things is um, there are areas that are forgotten. Um, on your hull surfaces, your sea chest, your inlets, um, definitely your shaft and, and, and uh, propellers need different attention nowadays. And there's products out there that work incredibly well. Um, your um, anchor wells or things like um, bell thrusters, be sure to actually get in there, take your props off your bell thrusters, spend some time and clean them up because that's where places you don't go is where the pest will go. Um, rudders and boards um, pay the same sort of attention. On your entry surfaces, on your exit surfaces, buy another coat. So is it on your bow, on the front of your rudder or on the front of your keel? Um, just put a brush stroke down there because that's 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 where, where the product's going to come off first. Um, there's also the comment on um, with your keel blocks. Um, take a bit of time and talk to your, your operators that are offering you're traveling with or your trailers. And ask if you can just halt once the boat's lifted up and you can actually pay some attention to those areas. Um, if the travel lift operator or, or, or trailer operator is, is well advised ahead, he can normally schedule a bit of time, like 10 minutes, to actually pay some attention to where the boat's been standing. All right, next slide. Where do I clean and do your maintenance? Well, um, Tidal grids are interesting. I see that as my second point. Um, they are disappearing. So they're almost, unless you're in an area now where you don't have the facility to haul your boat out, um, they are, they are they're, they're certainly disappearing. So uh, a facility is far more preferable due to now the, the conditions that we have to up, operate under our local and also our central government laws and regulations. So therefore, where we put our scrapings, where we put our water blasting, and it limits the amount of product going back into the ocean. Now, I know everyone says, oh, will it come from the ocean? But when you think about it, if you've got a pest on there that you don't want to spread, the first place you don't want to put it is back in the ocean. So by using approved facilities is definitely a way of controlling that spread. Um, Cleaning and scraping, that's pretty obvious, um, environmental harm. And also check with your local body rules of what can be done because you'll see occasionally the cat up on the catamaran because it can land on a beach. Um, they'll go and give it a, a, click, a quick scrape. But um, my advice um, is, is, is definitely pull the boat out. Um, yeah, if you are clean water, um, cleaning, um, don't use a... A, um, a scrubbing brush as such, because all that's going to do is not only remove your film and your biofell, but it's also going to remove, it will remove your biofell. All right, next slide, please. How often? A $22 question. Um, for argument's sake, I can give you practical advice. My, my, my anti-fell that I, I work or I use, I know about every 18 months, that I've got to pull it out and give it some attention. Um, but in saying that, um, it, it really depends on your area and how bad your boat is fouling and also the product that you're using. Um, the thing up in North right now, we've got what we call our six in one program, which every Aucklander will know when they want to go to the Bay of Islands. So that's, we need proof of anti fouling if you wish to go to the Bay of Islands um, that it's been anti-fouled six months before or 
it's being water blasted a month before. So keep that in mind when you're thinking about your summer cruising. Um, yeah, so through that six and one scenario, you're normally anti-fouling and hauling out once for a wash. So that sort of covers that. But keep in mind, a clean boat is far more efficient. So therefore, if you're sailing, it's going to go faster. If you're like me and got a smelly diesel, I'm going to use less diesel, cover the same amount of ground, so it's good for the environment as well. Okay, next slide. That's you. You're all done, Brent. Bloody hell, that was quick. <laughs> um, yeah, so just, just, just summing up, talk to your neighbours, I guess, and... Um, and talk to the people around you and in the area because wherever your boat is based, the best people that know about the anti fowl that works are in that area. All right. Great. Thank you. <coughs> right, Sam, you're on. So our next in this section, we've we've um, we actually put out a, a call out to the industry um, a few months ago, and we had. We had four approach us, um, or four, and, and we, we also invited some, just to take two minutes each to present their products. So following these um, short presentations, we will move into a, into a question and answer with this panel. Um, but um, our first is Sam Peters from uh, Nano Protect. Um, the floor is yours, Sam. Thank you very much. Would you like to share a screen? Yes, please. Okay, can you see the full, the full yes. screen? Yeah. Okay, good morning. My name is Sam. I'm from Nasil. We are the official distributors of Nasil here in New Zealand. Um, so, sorry, I just want to move this across. Um, yeah, so the structure of our product is inherently antimicrobial and antiviral, um, anti moss as well. We are a nano ceramic coating. Um, we actually have over 40 distributors in over 140 countries with over three much of Nasiol is, is huge in many ways. Um, we are anti-corrosion, um, very high hydrophobic properties, very easy to clean. Um, and as I said, inherently anti-fungus, anti-moss, anti-algae, all the nasties um, don't stick. Um, So the thing that makes Nasiol different to other products on the market is that our coating actually bonds to the surface rather than sitting on top like a Teflon layer would, for example. Um, that works because the one end of the molecule bonds to the substrate of the surface, while the other end of the molecule repels anything that touches that surface. There is also no leaching. Um, it's applied at 80 nanometers thick, very, very fine. And the solid content of this product is actually only 1%. Um, it is extremely durable. Um, being a spray on product Nasiol can also be applied in those hard to reach areas that are more difficult to reach with paint. Um, it's also scratch resistant, incredibly durable with a 10 H hardness. It's chemical resistant, it's easy to clean, and it actually has a guaranteed um, lifespan of five years. However, we actually expect it to last a lot longer beyond that because of how inherently hard it is. You can compare that to the hardness of a diamond um, in some instances. So yeah, Nanoprotect, we, nasiol.com is the international website. Our website is www.nanoprotect.nz. Uh, my partner, Hannes, is actually in the call as well. And feel free to reach out to us if you would like any more information like safety data sheets. Um, if you want to book a session with us, we can discuss the, the particulars of whatever your needs may be. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sam. Uh, Richard. Richard Cleave from Coppercoat Pacific is our next presenter. I'm just wondering if he's got problems with the sound actually. Can you hear us, Richard? 
Okay, in that case, we might just, I'll see what's happening with him. Glenn from Marine Protection Solutions. Glenn, are you happy to make a start? Yeah, definitely. Great, thank you. Right, hi everyone. This is Glenn from Marine Protection Solutions. We uh, started importing the adhesive anti-fouling films, the silicon-based films in 2016. Uh, we, we have two films. We have the flow silicon film, which comes out of, uh, currently out of France, and the MacLide film, which comes from PPG Paints and Avery Denison, which comes out of Belgium. Uh, both the, the films, the flow silicon film, we've had an opera since 2017 on our first boat. Um, that's still in superb condition. And um, it's going really, really well with no attachments. Uh, just a little bit of slime that, that can be removed at seven knots. The MacLide film from PPG, they give, the company gives uh, that a five-year manufacturer's warranty. To have the film supplied, all the existing anti-foul has to be removed. And then each film has its own specific primer that that is applied to the film. So this is pretty much a silicon film. I'm not sure if you can see it. It just peels off the back and we apply. There's no, no biocides. Uh, it, it wipes down with a, a chamois. They can be cleaned in the water. Uh, there's no requirements that they have to be pulled out. So that's a bit of a saving there. So those are pretty much the two films. Um, we also are the importers and distributors in New Zealand for the cover plast range of products out of Italy, which is the two pot um, paints, which are being used up in, up in Europe as the antifouls being reduced or the biocides are being reduced out of the antifouls. So the two pot paints are, are more designed for the, the trailer boats, um, the, the dry stack boats that go in and out of the water. And they do need maintenance. Um, we also, they actually have a large range of products, the cover blast um, from crystal crop, crystal yacht, and, and a whole range of nano products for boat maintenance and cleaning. Um, so they're all available through Marine Protection Solutions. And we're also now just importing th through the Netherlands the H2O Sonic Shield and Ship Sonic ultrasound units, um, which, which they're using also up in Europe in conjunction with the two pot paints um, that, that other companies are also developing. I know Hempel's got one. And um, so we're working in conjunction and actually running some trials as we speak of these units in conjunction with uh, the ultrasound. And the ultrasound are also available for conventional antifouls. So they're not limited to um, just the, the non-biocide uh, films that, and, and paints that we have. So um, yeah, if you want to have a look at some products or talk to me later, you'll, you'll find us on our Marine Protection Solutions website and happy to answer any questions. So thank you for that. Thank you very much. We might we may well have some questions once we've um, once we get to that section. So thank you, uh, Richard. How's your sound going? I think you're having some trouble with your speakers. <laughs> no, Richard's still having problems, I think. Right, we'll move on to Clint. Clint from Hot Prop Speed. Yeah, good morning. Thank you very much. Um, our product is 100% New Zealand uh, developed and, uh, and it's had an amazing, uh, I guess, history. So uh, we actually were invented on one boat in the Bay of Islands 22 years ago, and now uh, around the world, we are seen as the um, largest selling foul release product on the market. Um, and as I say, proudly New Zealand. Uh, we've been a New Zealand marine success story. Uh, eight years ago, there were three of us. Today, we're 45, including five full-time staff in the USA, five in Europe and one in Australia. Um, and we export to over 40 countries. We're used by some of the largest brands in the world, uh, Riviera, Hinkley, uh, just recently, we are now on uh, the New Zealand Navy's three largest ships, Tikaha, Aotearoa, and, um, oh gosh, what's the other one? Hey, Canterbury. And um, 
were also used and specified in the largest boatyards in the world. The largest is the Fort Lauderdale Marine Centre, uh, who can pull 45 to 50 super yachts at a time. Uh, we, are, we are the product there. So um, B92 in Barcelona, Monaco Marine in France. So as a Kiwi product, we're incredibly proudly um, expanded all over the world. Um, our product is foul release. It's not an anti-foul. Um, and um, we was originally designed for propellers, but our customers all over the world have found new uses for our product on struts, rudders, uh, trim tabs, swim platforms, bow thrusters. Um, and also just over the last couple of years, we've developed two new products. Um, and I, I heard the word niche areas. Uh, we're great in niche areas. Um, and uh, um, so in, in the area of transducers, we've got a product now called Foul Free. And that was developed in association with EMR, the world's largest transducer manufacturer. And Lightspeed for underwater lights, developed in association with Lumashore, one of the world's largest underwater manufacturers. So, um, yeah. The, um, the other issue is that we, um, we have fantastic training videos. So if you wanna look at, just go to propspeed.com, uh, we have um, people comment all the time on the quality and the ease of understanding of our training videos. In New Zealand, our product is available through all the Burns Co stores. Um, and um, as I say, we, our track record is, is I think, you know, certainly second to none. Uh, we are also working with conservation projects. So our products swimming around on the backs of, of tracking systems on whale sharks and manta rays in Indonesia. We're on a turtle in a marina in, uh, in uh, Florida who can't, uh, he can't uh, control his, uh, his buoyancy. Uh, so we're painted on some weights. Um, so all sorts of really interesting things we're involved in. So we very much back that. I'm also a past president of the New Zealand Marine uh, Marine uh, um, Export Group, uh, so also we back the industry big time. So uh, thanks very much for the time, um, and uh, certainly ha happy to handle any questions. Thank you very much, Clint. Now Richard's back, and he looks like he might be smiling. Can you hear <laughs> us now, Richard? <laughs> I can. That's a better. Bit of a battery issue, unfortunately. Uh, your turn. What do you Um so I'm Richard Cleave. I, um, I've spent most of my life uh, either in or on the sea, so it's, uh, it's my natural habitat, and uh, I um, love being involved in, uh, in protecting, protecting that. So a little over two years ago, we were awarded the distribution rights for copper coat uh, multi-season anti-foul coating. And since beginning uh, then, in the, in the past two years, we've introduced a biodegradable remover for traditional anti-fouling paints. That was developed in Vancouver. Uh, a ceramic two-part epoxy barrier coating, which is developed out of the oil industry in Texas. Um, and two new copper coat <coughs> anti-foul products. And also in that time, we've established a um, a network of uh, professional applicators. So we've, we've done a lot of innovating in, uh, in, in a short time. Um, because we have no um, brand constraints, um, we've been able to select the best of type products from around the world um, um, to develop a, a bottom coating system that, that is 100% reliable, is effective for 10 years and is also it's not a complex product to apply, or the products are not complex to apply. Um, our company ethos and, and our key criteria in product development are blending proven uh, and emerging technology and leaving nothing to chance, providing the best value solutions to vessel owners and operators, providing sustainable solutions, and being an exemplar business for environmental responsibility. Copper coat is quite different to most um, antifoul products and it is not a paint, it's a, a two-part epoxy. So unlike most products, it performs two functions. The first function is that it protects the hull substrate. So being a two-part epoxy, it replaces multiple layers of primers and undercoats that are typically required before a traditional anti-fouling paint is applied. 
Um, so it provides the same or a greater amount of protection to hulls without adding the time, the costs, the risks, and the weight of multiple preparatory coatings. And its second function, which is which it's best known for, of course, is that it prevents biofouling. Um, it does this not just for 12 or 18 or 24 months, but for 10 or more years. The application of our two coat protection and biofouling provincial system can be completed in as little as two days. A two coat system is also monolithic. Um, that is that the coats the coatings are chemically bonded, removing all the writs of delamination between different coating types, which sometimes occurs. So the main characteristics of the products and the coating systems are these. Um, copper coat itself is proven internationally over 80,000 vessels. It is a non-eroding product. In other words, it does not leach biocides and copper, pure copper is the only biocide present and copper coat, that, so it doesn't leach biocides into the marine environment. It's electrically, um, electrolytically inert and non-corrosive. It does not contain any solvent, so as well as um, not leaching anything uh, unkind into the marine environment, it also doesn't um, contain any VOCs, which are of course responsible for the depletion of the ozone layer. Um, another sustainable aspect of copper coat is that it's uh, produced entirely from recycled copper in Europe. Um, and uh, out of that comes a 99%, a 97% pure copper ultrafine powder, which is um, suspended in the epoxy coating. Hey, Richard, um, we um we have to we have to sort of get, get on with the um balance of the the presentation and and your your two minutes passed just a little bit ago. Can I ask sure. you just to maybe let people know your website um because sounds like a great product and just so they can look it up if they'd like to. Yeah, just at www.copcoatpacific.com. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> great. So we're just going to move on to um, opening up to questions. Now we actually, um, so all of the all of the panelists that are here, I'd like you um, just to um, be part of this conversation where you where you feel like you can. We actually accepted questions when people registered, so I have a list here. But any um, any of the attendees, um, please do put your put your hand up if, if you'd like to um, raise anything, and and we'll certainly accept that. So the first question um, came through from Derek. Um, and what, I, what I've actually done with some of these questions is I've consolidated them. We tried to respond to most of them. We had quite a few questions, tried to respond to most in the presentations, but I consolidated some. Um, Derek said, how do you deal with intermittent trips from Auckland to the Bay of Islands, maybe only one month apart? So I guess he's trying to, um, he's trying to deal with the, the six and one rule that the marinas require, um, which is a little bit different to the council rules. And he's just asking, how, how do I cope with that? So um, I might perhaps ask Brent if you have any advice for Derek. Yeah, it's, I guess when you're going to think about going to the Bay of Islands and you may be doing four or five trips within four or five months, is you make sure that you actually anti-foul the vessel just before you leave on your first trip. That'd be my advice. And that gives you six months to play around up there. Um, and then, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a tricky one, but um, I think that's the best solution is that just, just schedule your maintenance at just pre your first trip and that'll get you through the summer. Um, yeah, that'd be my advice. Mm. Does anyone else have anything to add to that one? Um, one point I'd make is that um, I suppose our product's very, very different in that it's an epoxy and it's not a paint and it's a non-eroding product as opposed to an ablative product. So we think there's a very good case for certainly the boat being cleaned. Um, if it's showing any any growth, you know, within a month of traveling. Um, but to, as far as recoating goes, um, the efficacy of copper coat is 10 years. Um, and the maintenance of copper coat is to burnish it with very fine paper once every 18 to 24 months. So 
um, we believe is a different case for mm. copper cut in terms of its requirements for might be, might be something you need to work through with the marinas <laughs> yeah. that are enforcing yeah. that rule, Richard. Work in progress. Yeah. And, it's, yeah, it's and difficult. this is Glenn again from Marine Protection Solutions. Yes. With, with the um, adhesive anti fouling films, the silicon based films, we've actually been working originally with the Northern Regional Council um, to, to be able to just travel between areas without. Um, any cleaning basically and they were pretty receptive to that idea happening and then the uh, all the councils have got together for the clean for good to go um, clean. Mm. yeah so so we're still in the process of having or, or like getting a exemption for the films that you can right. actually travel anywhere mm. without without having to um, you know they can just be wiped they can be wiped in the water or they'll self-clean at a reasonable speed Okay. Um, thank you. Now we 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 um through through our promotions of this event with the island the island cruising association sent quite a few people our way and a couple of them had questions about coming in from overseas and um, Cole who I think is actually here and Suzanne asked a question: Do they need to apply new anti foul prior to leaving Australia or is a hull clean a hull scrub sufficient? So I don't know if there's someone here who knows a little bit about CRMS and, and the requirements for international vessels coming in might be able to assist with that question. Yeah, I can assist with that. It's actually something that was recently. Just keep your mouth, keep your face close yeah. to the computer. Hello, you there? Yeah. <laughs> so um, it's an interesting thing. So generally a clean hull is acceptable by MPI and, and once MPI have given you the okay to travel throughout New Zealand, this is the, probably the legal standing more than anything else, you're able to do so. Just to let you know, it's it's the actual government authorities up in Northland that are creating the six and one, which we then have to, uh, to um, police. So it's an interesting crossover between MPI and I and, and, and the local bodies, because if you're inspected at the, the port of arrival by MPI, generally you've got the clean hull to go and carry on. but um, look, if you're coming from Australia, a water blast is more than sufficient um, in, in my imagination as far as what MPI restrictions would be when you enter the country. Okay. Um, someone asked Jonathan, who is sailing into New Zealand from Australia in about a year, um, has asked if we can outline local rules. And um, I can tell Jonathan that the rules, there's link, all of the regions have slightly different rules and requirements, and there's links to all those on the website marinepest.nz. But I'm wondering if perhaps, um, Peter, you might be happy just to talk about the, the rules generally, um, just about how, 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 how they might look and about how a, a boat owner might approach that arriving in New Zealand and thinking about cruising around, and maybe a little bit about why it's particularly important in your region. Great, thanks. So Peter Lawless, I'm the Marine Biosecurity Coordinator for the top of the South Island. So I've been in this game for about 13 years now. Um, I think um, the to simplify things, if your hull is clean, um, you're fine. Um, the rules differ between regions uh, and between regions and the um, and the marinas within the regions. Um, and so, but when you get down to it, if um, when you're approaching New Zealand or you're moving between regions, you have freshly slipped and anti-fouled your boat, you're going to be fine. Um, and so uh, the marina rules are largely around when things were cleaned uh, or anti-fouled. The rules for the different regions are mostly about how much is actually on your hull. And we're generally looking at hull fouling of below 5% uh, as being the most common rule uh, across the country. I, I won't go into the levels of fouling things because there's a few ins and outs there. But in the end, it's it's really simple. It's like your campaign, Zoe. If you clean below, you're good to go. Thank you very much. Um, there is a question from Michael about how to identify marine pests. And Scott, I'm hoping that you can address that response, perhaps just with reference to the marinepests.nz site and the pest ID guide. 
and all the photos um, of pests on there. I don't know if they're talking about identifying them on their hull or if they find them somewhere, but um, generally if uh, the best thing to do is uh, be knowledgeable about where you're going and, and who the agencies are that oversee it. So um, if you see something that's suspect, you know, you're seeing it in the natural environment, photographing it and having good site location sent to management agencies like it's on your hull. Basically, you, the big assumption you make, what the, everybody has said, that your hull needs to be clean. If you see something growing on your hull and you're going somewhere else, it's best to err on the side of caution. And most of the stuff that grows on vessel hulls, most of the time, it's not native, uh, except for muscle. Within those muscle communities, there's the other stuff. So, best just to make sure your hull is clean before you're transiting anywhere from out of the country or. Intra and, and, and point. Thank you very much. Um, right, any any questions from attendees that you'd like to raise whilst you're here? I think that might be a wrap. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Zoe, for organising this. It's um. You know, even for those of us that have been around a while, it was really informative. I learned a lot. I'm glad. There's a there's a lot of knowledge out there, and I think it would be good to keep getting keep getting these experts like yourselves on board to to share what you know. <laughs> yeah, I like to thank everybody from the industry because um, it's really interesting to all of us. We can't advocate for any particular brand, but just knowing the technology that exists and the new stuff out there really helps a lot. Thank you. Yeah, and so, and so, sorry, just uh, um, it is 